Today in the studio, folks, as always, got a real treat. Chris Noggles in the house. Happy this, to be here. This dude, money mentor, speaker, author, former pro snowboarder, host of HGTV show something, The Money School. You got is it, it The Money School? The Money School. Now, what is The Money School? Money School teaches people how to take back control of their money by showing them how to be the bank. See, now what does that mean, be the yeah, bank? So basically we use... Uh, we use a system that's been around a while to show people how to do exactly what banks do with money. And they just take back control, change one thing, and that's where their money goes first. Uh, using specially designed so you, and engineered whole life policies is kind of where that all flows into. So you just bypass the bank, put your money here. Yes, sir. And then it pays you, I'm sure. Yeah. Everything that you pay the bank comes back to you. Hmm. Takes Interesting. time. Interesting. Dude, you were a pro snow, snowboarder to a money mogul. What is a money mogul? I don't know. Just somebody that just deals with money. I, I'm an ex-Wall Street guy. 16 years on Wall Street. Did my time there. Learned dude, the, dude, you look... I mean, snowboarding and Wall Street usually don't go together. Dude, there's, yeah, they don't go together. So early 2000s, when the planes hit the tower, I had my retail stores going. We had just opened a couple new locations, and I'd never gone through a recession. So I was just a young pro snowboarder. And then when that hit, my business dropped 30%. I needed a job. So I went and applied at Little Caesars Pizza to deliver pizzas at night and they, they weren't hiring. So I put my resume out. The only ones that called me on that resume out of everywhere I put it were Wall Street firms. Hmm. And, you know, I walk in and the guy slides the keys down the table and says, if you work at this firm, that's the car you're going to drive. I'm like, damn, sign me up. It was like boiler room. It was, I didn't watch that movie at the time, but that's exactly where he picked that up from. Yeah. So that was uh, 2003. I entered Wall Street. I uh, became one of the top advisors in my uh, years there. Learned a lot of things, saw a lot of things I hated. And where it comes full circle is I never wanted to be in Wall Street. I just wanted some money so that I could get through and just get back to doing my life. And I, I literally like I was so out of my element. When I got there, you know, you got to wear a black, a gray or a navy blue suit. So I, this company Volcom, which was a company I did a lot of stuff with uh, snowboarding, they made suits. I went and I bought they suits. They did? Yeah, they still do. S snowboarding suits? Snowboard, well, no, 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 like suit suits. But they, they, they you know, had fancy interiors with like pinstripes and cool stuff. So that was how I mentally got over that hurdle of like, how do I balance this? How do I wear a suit every day when I've never put a suit on? So I got a suit made by one of my favorite snowboard skateboard companies, Volcom. And literally that's, that's how I did it in the beginning. Hmm. So, so how old are you now? 45. And so 20 years ago, where were you? 20 years ago, I had my clothing line. I, I had a chain of skateboard snowboard shops and living so, in Buffalo, New York. So you've been entrepreneurian your whole life. 16 years old. Huh? Why, why, how do you think that? took place are your parents entrepreneurs absolutely not no my mom ran a daycare just to be home with me my dad you know he was uh an alcoholic so he really wasn't too much part of my life back then and uh i don't know i i didn't become an entrepreneur because i wanted to be an entrepreneur I became an entrepreneur because the job i worked at degraded me so badly it was a restaurant that i just couldn't deal with it how'd so they degrade you every time i went there they the guy just fucked with me, man. I'd go there and he'd tell me to go in the cooler and get something. He'd tell me exactly where it was. I'd go where to where it was supposed to be. It wasn't there. I'd freak out running around the cooler trying to wonder like, where is this thing? And every time I come back out and be like, you know, where is this? And he'd like just ravage me. And uh, I, I this belittle, went on for belittle months. you, make you feel stupid and to the point where I was literally depressed. Wow. Yeah. And he bullied you. He bullied you. He was a bullier for it, sure, man. Bitch was a bully. He was. A, yes, where sure was his was. name? Dominic. Dominic what? Let's call him out. De Flippo. Dominic, Dominic De, De Flippo. Flippo. Let's find him on social media, yeah, Bomb Squad. No Tell him, open. quit bullying people. <laughs> How long ago was that? 20 oh years? Gosh, I was 16 years old, man. Oh, that was freaking up. Long time okay, ago. Okay, so, so you got bullied at a, at a job and you said, basically, fuck this. I came in one day and he started it on me and I said, I quit. I was scared because I had to go home and tell mom that I just quit my first real Why job. Would, would mom whoop your ass? No, not at all. Why would you be scared? I don't know if I was scared. I, I thought she'd be disappointed. Yeah. You know, so I came home, but I can't have plan B. I said, mom, I know I quit, but I'm going to start a clothing line. I'm going to start printing shirts with Mr. Mahalski, who was my art teacher. 
And after school, we did. We printed a dozen shirts. I sold them out of my backpack, had friends do artwork, and then they helped me sell it. And I just built this thing over the year. How big so, did it get? Uh, I don't know. We had, uh, it was a couple hundred thousand dollars, I think, when we actually turned it into the store. I had four seamstresses working for me, making snowboard jackets and pants. Well, and it was little, popular. Yeah, locally. You know, like East, East Coast, it was pretty popular because I was a up and coming rider. So I would just go to all the shops that I knew that were putting on these events. And I would just say, hey, can you sell my clothes? Started off as consignment and then it sold and they would just buy my stuff. Because of the designs? Yeah, it was just, it was just fun. It was were different. you just making shit that you'd wear? I did. I did. Like I said, there, was, there were certain companies I loved that were real cutting edge, Volcom being one. So I took that modeling and my mom was a good sewer. She could sew pretty well. So we would buy like a dozen long sleeve shirts. We'd rip the sleeves down, sew in two pieces of piping, like a red and a white, and offset it and then have it embroidered and then just put together a really cool story behind everyone. All my shirts had like a storyline on them. Uh, it, it was a lot of fun, man. It was, it was a time of my life, to be honest. So how long did you do that for? No, I don't know. I, I mean, I changed the name of it. Uh, uh, Russell Simmons with Fat Farm uh, reluctantly sent me a letter saying, hey, you know, cease and desist. And Why? What were you called? Fat Clothing Company, P-H-A-T. Ah. Even though I had the, like mine was, uh, uh, what year was it? 1992, I started. So I was, I predated him. But, you know, my attorney at that time, who was just a local friend, said, you can't fight this. Changed the name. So then Lurkin Syndicate came out of Fat Clothing Company. Lurkin Syndicate. Lurkin Syndicate. Like lurking around, but a syndicate of friends. Yeah. So, so this is snowboarding mainly. That's it. Skateboarding and snowboarding. Skateboarding, snowboarding. Yeah, so if I'm a skateboarder, I, I might have heard of it. I don't know. Being out here, probably not. Because I've heard Maybe. of Volcom. Yeah. I wasn't that big, though. We were very localized. And then you opened stores. Yes. In two, brick in and mortar. November 1994, Fat Man Board Shops opened its first location in the Lockport Mall. And that's the one you know, my mom you know, really you know, believed in me on and put everything on the line. Why? What'd she do? Well, you know, to open a store at 17 years old, you got to have some money. I don't, I didn't grow up with any money. I grew up in a 700 square foot, two bedroom house with nothing. You know, that's just my upbringing. So when I went to the bank to get an SBA back loan, they said, Hey, you know, we need collateral. I didn't even know what that meant. I'm like, what, what is collateral? Well, we need something to back the loan. Oh, no problem. I got a 1986 Buick Skyhawk, a KX 125 and a baseball card collection. Any questions? I said, no, 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 kid, we need something a little more. So I went around to all my family members. They all told me I was crazy. This isn't going to work. That's a stupid idea. My father said, come work at the factory with me. I'll get you an interview. Uh, that was a big falling out. I sent him cats in the cradle like the cassette back then. But my mom saw this happening. My mom didn't want my dream to fail. So one day she said, what's it going to take to make this happen? And I said, I don't know. They need collateral. She said, what if I put the house up? Now, I'm, I, listen, today, I, I'm like, I would have said, Mom, you can't do that. I'm 17, man. I'm a punk snowboard kid. I'm like, yeah, Mom, let's do this. And we went. Damn, that's yeah, cool. Is, is, and ultimately, Mom got her money back, I'm sure. Yep, five years later. So we paid that loan off. It wasn't easy. I was going to say, run. no, Mom, Mom lost the house, actually. <laughs> no, no, Mom didn't lose the house. She still lives in the same house today. Good. So... How long did you do that for? And when did you meet your wife? Uh, well, so during that, I did the, the retail stores till 2010. After the 2008 recession, I was in a rough place. So I sold the stores to one of the guys I used to compete with. But in the whole mix, my wife came into the mix and I, I was an Audi guy. You know, I always drove Audis, but Audis break down all the time. So I had this, this shop that I'd always get it repaired at. And there was this lady that was always there. Lori was her name. She was boisterous and just persistent as all can be. And every time I was in there, you know, she just started conversations with me. Well, one day I'm arguing with my girlfriend. She was a hairstylist. I don't know if that means anything, but been on the, -hoo. but any, I'm arguing with her and Lori hears this. And she says, after she says, Chris, you got to go on a date with my daughter. I said, Lori, back off. You know, and she says, no, did you, you got to. Did you say it just like that? Yeah. I, I, Lori was a very persistent woman. Why would, woman. why would you say back off though? Because I just got done arguing with my girlfriend on the phone. So she just like came right in hot. Like, wow. Yeah, but I just said, you got a picture of her? I, well, Brad, I'm no, I'm no dummy. I did immediately. I, you know, after that, after I calmed down, I said, well, you know, what, what's she look like? Showed me a photo. I'm like, okay. So I went down the street to a coffee shop. And I'll never forget this day. My car was in the shop again. So I had a, like a beat up loner. And I park it way far away. I walk in. And right over there on that chair, I see this bomb looking blonde didn't look like the photo her mother showed me and i said fuck because i knew what was going to happen next 
then began the process of trying to get crazy out of my house. And uh, that took a couple months. So you said there's a funny story of how you met your wife. Well, the funny story is like that. You know, when I saw her, I knew I was going to have to end the relationship, get, get the one out of my house and begin it. So maybe that's not as funny as James you know, seemed to think it was, but you know, he wanted so, me to bring that one up. <laughs> yeah. So, <laughs> so what's, what's no, funny, funny, what's funny is you saw her and knew you'd have to get the crazy one out. That's correct. And then what ensued there? A lot of broken dishes. You said of, two months. What'd you yeah. do? Go home and say, I'm done? I built up the courage to do that, but eventually how, told how her. How long did it take you to tell her? Maybe a week. Were you talking to this girl in between? Mm -mm. No, I never. I How'd never, you know you could have that girl then? I really didn't, but I knew at that point there was. But you were set up on one date, right? You went mm -hmm. to meet her. That was it. That's, That's cheating, took. fool. That's, <laughs> That's funny. I know it. <laughs> Girls out there right now be like, "That's cheating. You cheated, bastard." Well, you know, I'm not out. I'm not trying to make new friends. But so. you wouldn't have met your wife had you not. That's true. See, that's the thing. The one you were with probably wasn't the one. You knew that. She was psycho before that too, wasn't she? That is correct. Very Breaking cool. dishes. She did a lot of interesting things. Yeah. So what would you tell people listening if they're in a relationship where like they know they're not in love with this person and this person is not going to be the one? Stop wasting time. Time is so precious. Dump them. Just dump them. Just get out of it. It's going to be hard. You're going to, you're going to wish you didn't, but there's a reason you're feeling that way in your gut that this isn't right. It's Chris right. Noggle just caused thousands of breakups all across the country. All for the good, man. Dude, one time I told somebody just some simple advice, right? You get what you tolerate. You know what I mean? You get what you tolerate. That's all I said. Went home, divorced his wife, and told me and gave me the credit. And I'm like, well, dude, I don't want the credit for that That's shit. That's good advice, though. But now the dude's happier than pig and shit. See the and difference? So am I. So That's am right. I. Exactly. 14 That's my point. years with Larissa. We've got a two-year-old daughter. And honestly, it's, it was the greatest gift God could have given me. See? Look at there. Give you a bomb on that one. All right. So eventually you ended up how you get a TV show. Like, wow. like you must have, so. you must have, there's been a journey somewhere. Yeah. There's a lot of in-betweens there. So had the retail stores, sold the, re the retail stores in 2010, almost went bankrupt developing a strip mall for them. I sold that in 14, but I got real heavy into real estate in 2009. Warren Buffett says buy low and sell high. So I knew real estate was low. I was a wall street guy. So I started doing that and I, I, then I thought I was making it in real estate. I was still doing Wall Street. I was still snowboarding professionally. And then in 14, the bank, which I was getting all my financing from, pulled the rug from underneath me and they froze my lines of credit. I, I re reached my debt to income ratio and I had to sell all those properties. So I spun straight down. I mean, me and my, my she was my fiance then, Larissa, we had our dream house that we bought. I had to sell that, had to sell the bedroom set, had to sell all the cars. I literally was at one of the lowest points in my life. Larissa, you know, and me split for a short period of time. And uh, during that whole experience, what I ended up figuring out is like what I wanted to do. And I didn't double down on Wall Street, but what I did is when me and Larissa got back together, we went to this, well, I was at a low point. I got a postcard that said, come to this seminar to learn how to flip houses. I didn't want to go, but on the back, it said, we'll give a free iPod shuffle away. So I had nothing to lose in an iPod shuffle to gain. So off I went. And there I ended up swiping my card, paying five grand to go to another event where I met uh, Greg Hurling and Mike Baird and a whole bunch of people that are still in my life today. And in meeting them, that catapulted me. But when I was at that, that event that I paid for, I watched two TV show stars get on that stage. Me, me and Larissa in the front row. And I remember saying to Larissa, I looked over, I said, sweetie, if we're ever going to have a show or if we're ever going to speak on that stage, we got to have a show. So that was it. I literally came up with the idea. Now, being a pro snowboard, I had been in front of cameras a lot, filming uh, my retail stores. We had two guys, Kyle and Ryan, who did video production for us. So I basically hired Kyle to come in and film our pilot. And we sent it out to all the TV shows. It was like it was like flipper flop meets jackass. I had all my skate team come in and they would demo the house and build ramps in the houses. And it was a cool concept, but HGTV didn't bite on it. But then we switched producers and we went to a different producer and they said, listen, we got to fit the square box. So we had the formula and we just started working toward that. And, you know, the whole process is long. It took years. And through that whole process, me and Larissa, I, I started kind of easing off of Wall Street. I'd already sold the stores and, you know, we were just doing flips. Mm. And then one day, one day it happened. 
We got that call, you know, out of green light. We had it. We were airing on HGTV. Now we didn't go on to to do the full series, and that's a whole nother story in itself. But I burned the boats. And I went to my broker dealer. I was one of the, I was a really high level advisor and I went to them. I had a bunch of OBAs, outside business activities that were approved. And I said, Hey, listen, we got approved for our show. Can I get an OBA for this? And the lady in compliance says to me, she says, I can't issue another OBA. You got to make a decision, Chris. Are you going to be an advisor or a TV show star? I came back to my office, the guy next to me, Mike, who had a great practice. I said, you want to buy my practice? We put the deal together and he now runs my, my old advisory practice. That was 2018. So I was out of Wall Street. I had no real sure income outside of the flips. And off we went. And it all worked out. No, it didn't. It didn't? Well, the TV show didn't go. I remember I was driving home one night, late at night. Phone rang. It was the producer. I pick it up, super excited. Oh, my God, this is it. I'm getting it. We're getting the series because we, you know, we just knew we were. And it was a somber voice. And he says, hey, I got some bad news. They're not taking the show. Discovery bought HGTV and they're not doing any new shows. So I'm sorry. Dude, I didn't. I'll, I'll never forget that moment. I'm thinking, going 55 miles an hour. Should I just jerk the wheel to the right and see mm -hmm. what happens? I mean, like, it was just that moment. Like when you put everything into one thing and then that one thing just blows up in your face. But I will tell you, when I got home and I told my wife, she took it well. Remember Greg, the Greg guy, Greg Hurling, who is now a good friend and we were doing some business together. He calls me up right after I got home. I'm a mess. And, he, and he, I answer the phone. And he's super positive. And I'm like, Greg, 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 who told you? Because I'm thinking he's just trying to cheer me up. And he's like, Chris, told me what? I'm like, come on, you got to know. And because he was behind the show too. He had a lot to lose for the show not happening. He said, I, no, I'm just calling you. I'm excited for the things we're doing. I can't, I just want to call and say, I'm really excited about what we're putting together. And I said, I didn't, I didn't get the show. And I thought that was it. You know, sometimes when you, when you got something big, like a show about to happen, a lot of people just latch on, but when the show doesn't happen, you just kind of expect that they're just going to be like, ah, all right, I'm, I'm going another direction. A lot of people did, but he didn't. He's now my business partner. He's a dear friend of mine and we do a lot of stuff together. So fast forward to today. Yeah. What are you doing now? So do a lot of things, but uh, travel around the country speaking about how to be your own bank and how people can do what we talked about a little bit earlier, how they can change one thing and that's where their money goes first. Then they can take over and you know become their own bank by basically just doing exactly what they're giving money. If somebody's got a car can, payment. Can you get cash out? Yeah, absolutely, immediately. So, so let's say you take, let's just use 10 grand, simple math, right? You got 10 grand. Now you hear me talk on one of my you know things and you say, all right, he said, change one thing, change where this money goes. Okay. Don't put it in somebody else's bank because we know how a bank works. If you put money in somebody else's bank, let's use Bank of America for all intents and purposes. How much do they pay you? 1% maybe, Nothing. even at these rates? Yeah, I mean, you're like, no, but let's just call it one. The bank then takes your money and immediately sends your money out to work for them. They loan yeah, that yeah, money but, out. Yeah, but they have a whole bunch more of it. They do, they do. But because because what just, if they sent your money out and you needed it? If you needed the money back? Yeah. That's a unique thing. So if you needed it back, you could go in and you could take it back because they're not using yours. They're just leveraging your money, okay, through fractional reserve banking. But that's a whole nother topic. But just if you took, if you put your money there, you're making nothing. The bank's making 400 to 1300% more than you are. So if you took the 10 grand and you put it into your bank, which your bank, just to quantify, is a specially designed and engineered whole life. Now, everybody, when they hear that name, I know what they're thinking. Oh, that's the worst place. That's the worst suggestion and overpriced, expensive. But they don't understand. I'm not talking about the whole life your broke ass brother-in-law sells you. These are built upside down and backwards. When you put money in these, your money's immediately available in the next 30 days. Maybe not 100%, but up to 90% can be. So you then would take that money out. When you take the money out, you're not taking, you're not taking your money. It's a loan. It's a loan. You know how this works. You take a loan. So you're 10 grand still earning a guaranteed interest rate plus dividends, which with most of the companies is between five and 6%. You weren't making even one in the bank. Now you're making five to six, but you now are holding $9,000 of your 10,000 when you didn't interrupt the compound interest. You take that nine grand and you go make that money work for you. This is the thing a lot of people miss. It's not about the whole life. It's about what you do next. Take that nine grand. I know it's not a lot of money, but let's just say you wanted to lend that money. You want to become the bank and lend it out on a real estate deal. So you lend nine grand out at 12%. That money starts coming back to you in interest payments. Where are you going to put that? Most people put it back in somebody else's bank, but because you've created your own bank, 
you should take that money and put it back into your bank as a loan repayment. People are like, why would I ever pay myself back? Because every dollar you pay yourself back is the dollar you have to use the next day. Plus, you never lost interest on that money because it kept earning. That's what I do in a nutshell. So people, people come to a class or what? Yeah, we have a, a ton of videos on YouTube. Uh, everything I have is YouTube or on my website. They watch a 90-minute video. It teaches the entire concept. Shows them how to get all the money back for all the cars they're ever going to buy, drive, and own by changing just one thing. Hmm. People make it complicated, but it's really simple. What do they change? Where the money goes first. Stop Just, putting your savings in somebody else's bank, put it in your own bank, and then learn how to do what a bank does. Learn how to lend money or use your money. Here's an easy way. Like how many people you know have credit card debt? Uh, shit, me every month. Right. But you like, pay I off. have to pay the ridiculous amounts of credit card debt off every single month. Otherwise I'd be in stupid debt. But let's just say you had the intent to pay it off. But for some reason you couldn't. Then you're screwed. Right. How much is the credit card going to charge you, Brad? Dude, you're screwed. Right. 19%, 16%, 14%. Who knows? Think of all the people paying 19, 14, 25, 29% interest. Imagine if you just started treating your money the same as you treat the banks. You know, you'd have to have money to save, but even if it wasn't a lot, my first plan that I set up was 240 bucks because that's well, all I had. What if you loan it out and someone doesn't pay you back? Right? You about don't loaning have it any out. Money. We're talking credit cards. Let's, let's take a step back because a lot of people can't get that private lending part. Let's say you just had whatever, 500 bucks a month to save. You start putting 500 bucks a month into your banking policy. And then every quarter you take a loan from your policy and you pay down your credit card. Well, now you're paying interest on a lower balance, which means your minimum monthly payment for that credit card just went down. But let's just pretend that that minimum monthly payment didn't go down. Let's take the difference and take the difference and put it back into your bank as a loan repayment to your bank. If you kept doing that quarter after quarter after quarter, your debts would go away. And we got to take one from Dave Ramsey and start snowballing. We got to put debts in order from lowest balance to highest. Because a lot of people want to start with the highest interest rate. That's backwards. You got to do the lowest balance because it's easier to pay a low balance off than a high balance. And then you get that emotional, that euphoria when you pay that card off. So let's just say you had a credit card that was a thousand bucks and you're paying 15% interest and a hundred bucks a month trying to knock it down. You take and put the money, that thousand bucks in your bank, you take it out and you pay off the credit card. Now you no longer owe Visa a hundred bucks anymore. But what if you took that hundred dollars and instead of not giving it to Visa, you just wrote your name on the check and you paid it back to your bank. It's the equivalent of recapturing 20% or 14 or 15 or whatever the credit card was charging you. So now you're making money twice. People are like, well, how twice? Well, you were giving money away to Visa every month in interest. But remember, your money never left your account. Well, you wouldn't be giving life. Visa any money if you paid it off. That's true. But I'm trying to get you to think like the bank, right? I'm tr you used to give it to Visa and you never thought anything of it. So now that Visa is paid off, but where'd the money come from? You got to think of it like you're the bank. You take your money from your bank and you paid Visa off. A lot of people are like, well, duh, it was my money to begin with. Stop thinking like that. You got to think like you're the bank and do what the bank does. The hundred you used to give away, just put it back in your account. What's the difference? It's a hundred dollars you don't have to spend anymore. So now where's it going to go? Most people would just put it back in their bank, put it in your bank. And now all of a sudden that money is earning interest and you're paying less and less on the loan interest that the insurance company charges you. It's all about a spread. Okay. So every bank makes money by a spread. They pay you one, they charge five. They make a four point spread. If you're making six, like one of the policies, and it costs you four to borrow the money out of the policy, what's your spread? Two, right? So you're making two plus whatever that money makes when you send it out to work. Most people know how to make money once. I know how to make t money twice. Listen, don't give me too much. I didn't come up how with How long have you been doing it? Oh, since 2014. How much money this. do you have now? Oh, hundreds and hundreds of thousands in banking policies. I have nine policies now. But it's not so much the policies that matter. I mean, I don't care about having any money in the policies. I put it in and I send that money out to work, which well, is- well, What if someone has like five, 10 million to sit in the bank? That's perfect. I, I just what, had what, a, what literally just it? today, one of my clients got approved for 2.55 million. So he's putting 255 in. He's a real estate developer. He's then going to immediately take that money out. Now there's a little different game we play there. At how, that level. I don't get how you can take it in and take it out. Like, why would they give it to you if you're going to take it right back? Because they allow it. It's not what? every insurance company that allows this, but the ones we deal with allow us to put the money in and immediately take that money out. Now you can't take it all. Okay. So if you put what, 80%? a million in about 80 to 90% can come out right out of the hole. Okay. But then next year, let's just, so let's say you put a million in and then you can take 900 out. 
and the 900 goes to work. For well, why couldn't you take the 900 out and then go open another one? You could, but you, I don't think you'd do and that because that's just not going. a good use for your money. You could, but why, why do that? Because then the 900 is only making whatever, 6%. Your 900 could go out and make 12% through something like that, that software so why, company. So, so why don't you put your money there instead of there? Where or where? Why would I buy an insurance policy only to take 90% and go make money with it? Why wouldn't I just make money from the million I had in the first place? You could. But if you make money with the million, the million can only make money once. Imagine if that million dollars changed where it went first and went into the policy first. That money's going to earn interest for the rest of your life, whether or not you keep it in there or take it all out. And every year, that money's going to make more interest because it's compounding. A lot of people don't understand compound interest. So if you put a million in and it makes 6%, now next year, you're compounding on a million plus the 6% interest. And the year after, it's compounding again and again and again. So you're always compounding off a higher balance. But your money's Unless you out take there. it. No, it doesn't matter. Remember I said, it doesn't matter if you take the money out. When you take the money out, let's just use a million for a million. You put a million in, take a million out. How much is left in the insurance policy? Zero. No, a million. Well, again, then, then that's so the part let me I don't explain get. That. Why, yeah, so, why, why would an insurance company so here's borrow my million for 30 days and then let me take it back and still have the policy? This is easy. This is where I'm going to drop a bomb. Okay, When the insurance company gives you the million, remember, they're giving you a loan, but it's a loan you never have to pay back because what did the insurance company promise? You know life insurance. What's one of the promises life insurance makes? If you die, we'll pay. They're going to pay a death benefit when you die. The insurance companies don't say that you have to wait to die to borrow that money. So the insurance company, when they give you that million back, okay, that loan for the million, it's in advance of your death benefit. Your million never leaves your account, never stops earning the interest. They give you a million of your death benefit. So if you started with 10 million- What interest rate? hmm? What interest rate? Do they pay you or charge you? Charge you. Six and four. So, and it's one company, so you can be between five and six, depending on what company we use. So you net two. That's correct. This year. But next year, you're netting more because you're getting a bigger spread because your money's compounding. That four percent never changes. You're just getting more money. The the percentage doesn't change, right? Percentage doesn't change, but their spread does. Again, you got to think like a microscopically, bank. but yeah, it doesn't matter. Over time, it happens faster and faster. Sure, it does. And it's more than what somebody's making now. If you did just the same thing you said, if I had a million in the bank and I take a million and I lend it out at twelve percent, how much are you making? Twelve. But if I just change where the million goes first, and then I lend it out from there, how much I'm making? Twelve plus a spread. So how does one get qualified for a large policy? Got to look. Good on the inside as you do on the outside. Got to be healthy. I mean, you can't. What, if, what, what factors do they oh, go by? a lot of them. You know, if you had cancer. You Resting heart die. rate? Uh, yeah, but that's probably not as huge of a factor. If you had serious medical issues in the past, cancer, diabetes, you take insulin, you're not going to get approved. But that doesn't mean it's game over. Hmm. I mean, look at how ba- banks are the number one purchasers of whole life in the world. The top five banks in this country own $75 billion of whole life. It's called Bully, bank-owned life insurance. So when you really look at that, if we do all the banks in the country, it's over a trillion dollars right now. And people can look up, let's just go to the government website, okay? But if banks are doing this, why isn't everybody else? You know, so banks are an entity. A bank can't get an insurable policy. They can't, what's a bank going to do, right? So if you're an entity, you can't own a policy because there's no insurable interest. There's no life to insure. When you walked into the bank last time you did, how many vice presidents did you see? I don't walk into banks. When you did. Oh, shit. I don't know who was a vice president Everybody. and who wasn't. Everybody's a vice president. They all got the little tag that says vice president. But nobody ever asked, why does a bank need so many vice presidents? Well, banks need to place tier one capital and it needs to be guaranteed. So they put it in these policies. So to get that insurable interest, they promote their, their employees to vice presidents. So they have an executive because the vice president's an executive of the bank. Now the bank's got an insurable interest in that individual and they can take a policy out. What do they give to the employee for that? They give them a fully paid up policy, 50 or 100 grand. But how much is the policy the bank actually bought? Million, $2 million death benefit. Plus the bank can use all so the cash. So what if that value. vice president dies? Does the bank, is the bank the beneficiary? Absolutely. Rude. Yeah. That means a, cro- a crooked bank could just be whacking people. They've been doing this well. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, well, getting rich. Remember, uh, Walmart was doing this, but they weren't giving their employees anything. They got sued big time. They were taking policies out on all their executives but they weren't giving their employees anything. And then when one would die, Walmart got a bunch of money from the death benefit. The employee's family got nothing. They got sued. Look it up. It's public knowledge. Mm. That's rude. That is very rude, but that's business. They know how to make money. Banks are smart. Business is business. Hey, if you guys don't follow this dude, the Chris Noggle, N-A-U-G-L-E, the Chris Noggle. 
moneyschoolrei.com. Is that your website? Uh, they can just go to chrisnoggle.com. Everything's there. Chrisnoggle.com. Mm-hmm. Yep. So you got a buttload of followers. Yeah. What, where, what are they following for? Are you dropping like money advice? Yeah, every day. We're putting new stuff up, teaching people. I mean, money, mindset. You got um, a YouTube channel? Yeah. Big, you know, I put How many subscribers on that thing? Uh, I think we're at like 11,000 now. We just started that about a year ago, but I got some of the best in the business helping build it. Evan Carmichael and a couple other guys. He's good. He's real good. So where, what's next for you? So what's next is a project that I came up with two years ago. And it's interesting is two years ago, I had some money and I wanted to lend that money out. Now, being a real estate investor, I always wanted to be the bank and lend on real estate because that's how all the guys were making the money is they were the bank, they were lending. But every time I try to find a good borrower, it was hard. People would bring me a deal on a piece of paper and say, hey, you want to give me a hundred grand on this deal? And they give me the address. I'm like, dude, you never, you never been to a bank to see like they, they require a little more. So do I. So I started teaching people two years ago how to be a good borrower and a good lender. I was teaching private money and I wrote a book, The Private Money Guide. But what happened is I developed all these systems and I started lending it out and I had much better borrowers because now they had to qualify and give me a package called the perfect loan proposal. I had friends coming to me that had money and they would say, hey, can I lend on a deal? You're getting 12%. I I want 12%. I said, sure, jump in on this deal with me. So we started lending and then I moved it all over to Slack and then we had like a little community going on. But then it got bigger and bigger. And I said, wait a second. And I, I looked all over the place. Back when I was a pro snowboarder, and I'm going to get more haters. That's why I wore my special shirt. Haters need hugs too. When I was a pro snowboarder, I was smart. I was single, always. Stayed single the entire time. And when I'd travel out to an event, maybe Colorado, I would use dating sites. eHarmony was the one I used back then. Today, they got Tinder and stuff. But I would go on. I'd look all the, all the girls up that I wanted to hang out with. And I'd message them all. And by the time I got there, I had a date. It was awesome, right? Men, women, two profiles, you connect, community, boom. When I started lending money, I said, why doesn't that type of scenario work for money? Why isn't there a dating site for money? So I created it. I created Private Money Club, which is literally, it's like Tinder for money. There's people that have money that want to make money, and there's people that need money to make money. I provided the platform through profiles in a very expensive, you know software, and you know how expensive it is to develop it. So for two years, we've been just spending tons of money and testing it. And we've been, we're in beta two, but we launched to the United States, October 14th out in Utah for a full blown world. Well, I'm going to say a worldwide launch, but it's just us now. Well, that's going to be bigger than anything you've ever done. If you ask me, biggest thing I've ever done, Brad. Yeah. Cause I, got, I mean, to me, like shit, I might get in line. I got money and I need money. Yeah. I'm in both lines. I am too. So I just, you know, me and my, my wife doesn't work. She stay at home, but she likes flipping a house or two. So when she needs money for a house, I just go to my, my community. I just post the deal up and I get money and I, you know, now she's got the money to flip a house. On the other side, I lend all of my money through the same community and it just keeps building and building. Damn. Where do people go to get in that? Privatemoneyclub.com. Privatemoneyclub.com. That might be your biggest one ever. It will be. It will be. I mean, so what's the interest rate if I go in there and borrow some? So right now, almost every deal on there, there's lots of them. We'll go anywhere between low side of 10%. There's one deal on there for 18%. That big developer I was telling you about has got an 18%. Because, because the, the lender decides? The bar, yeah, the lender is going to decide what they're so going to do. So if I'm a lender, I'm going to go in there, register. And then when someone says, hey, I, did, 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 well, I, actually, I, I say, here's the money, but I get 12%. I said that wrong. So it can be either side. So the, you could come in there as a lender and say, hey, I want 12% on my money. And you could look through and just find, remember dating site. You can just look through, swipe left, because it is, it's swipe left and then swipe right when you find one you like. Find one that's 12%, that meets your criteria, swipe right, notifies the borrower. You guys talk in a community, a little chat community in the middle, and it walks you through a very regimented process to get the deal done. What information in the is mon- needed? F- to post the deal? I don't know. You need all the information about the deal. Probably should put together some information about your personal finances if you're the borrower, because I'm not lending to somebody unless I know what you look like. Yeah, but like, how do I pull their credit and see who they are? We have a software that's in there that allows you to do that. So we we found a, a software provider that did a real estate software that and we integrated it through API, and now that software is part of ours, and it allows you to underwrite the deals. So, but I mean, so like, if you're wanting a hundred grand. And I want to give it to you. How do, what am I reading about you to determine whether or not it's I like that a deal? Perfect loan proposal. So it would include all the details about the deal, the comps, the specs about the deal. What is it that, you know, I'm going to be doing to it, the scope of work. Then as you go further, let's say that's the surface and you're like, yeah, I like this deal. 
But you know, wh- what else? Like, what do you look like on paper? Personal financial statements, supporting documents, tax returns, uh, appraisal or BPO would typically be on there and on down credit reports, you know, typically, but it's, it's different. So if you want all that info, the borrower is going to provide it. If you don't ask for it, the borrower might only give you what you ask for. So as the lender, you have to decide what am I going to do to protect my money? And in protecting your money, all you got to do is just ask the right questions and know what to ask. How do you make dough? It's just a subscription. Thousand bucks a year. That's it. I don't get in the middle of anyone's deals. I'm hands off. But I will tell you, you know, if you play in the community, you do a deal and it goes south, kind of like a dating site. You go on a date, you, you know, you have a good night and someone gets pregnant. Don't go back to the dating site asking for retribution for that. You made the mistake. You should have protected yourself. In this community, like protect yourself. Invest in things you know, like, and understand. Make sure you've got the proper security, which is a mortgage or deed of trust. We teach it all. There's a whole process that walks people. It's not like we just say, all right, you ready, you ready, go. There's a process. And we walk you through that. But we're not going to tell you it's a good deal, a bad deal. We're not going to insinuate it's anything other than what you make it. So you got to build relationships in there. So how does the bomb squad help you out? Because I'm telling you, there's already a bunch of people going, well, shit, I got money to lend. I like that idea. Mm -hmm. There's people going, shit, I need money. I love that idea. Because there's there's like wholesalers running around looking at real estate. They need money. Well, they could go there. We run over $20 million of deal flow through through beta. Right now, you know, we've never advertised it once. We've never promoted it outside of our initial you, things. You wouldn't even need to. Just, just rumors will get that going. I know, but I am. You know, I, Steve Jobs is a hero, and the way he launched the Mac and the way he launched the iPhone will never, ever, like, it changed the way I view the way a product's launched. So October 14th, we're launching, and we're doing it big time. I spent a ton of money building the stage and this thing and hiring the right AV. And we've, we're have we spending about 250 grand on marketing for this one event to launch this it's, product. It's in Utah? Mm-hmm. Sundance. Do you want people to go? I do. Where do they go? Sundance Resort. Go to chrisnoggle.com and just look up the experience. Now, once you find that or they can, yeah, that's the best way. Just look up the experience and then, or I can give you the link for actually going right to it and we can post that with this and they can just go right to it. Or if they can't go to Utah, because, hey, not everybody wants to go to Sundance Resort. Then join us live. It will be streaming live, the entire thing. So when I'm doing it, you can be there in person, or you can be watching it from your from your couch. Heck, I don't care. You how can did, be how, naked. Are you raising money for the platform? I already raised money. I don't, not right now. Tranche 2 will be coming soon, but I, I'm, I'm pretty good at raising money. So. Dude, you're going to be Richard and foot up a bull's ass here pretty quick, sounds like. Yeah, well, I, I got good people on my team, and I'm doing this one the right way. I've made a lot of mistakes. It in sounds this. like this one's going to crack the, the home run. I got a seven-year runway. That's my plan. Seven years, I exit this company. Well, I don't even know if it'd take that long. It probably won't, but like, I know dude, my number. Get the word out. Hey, folks, here's a platform where if you want money, it's there. If you got money, it's you can, you can earn it. 12 percent that's right or whatever i can't believe it hasn't been done yet I me either low now that high. you're saying about it, i'm like shit dude i'd go in there like i said like hey i got a little money i want to invest go in there check deals boom 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 all these investors out around the country they're, they're looking for deals yeah well if you've got a website where all these people are putting on exact deal f- information and all someone has to do is thumb through the deals like i could even i could even hire an assistant to go through and pick out the cherries so you're just, I got like three or four lenders in there that do exactly that. They've got their staff that goes through and looks for the good deals. A lot of the deals, as soon as they post, they're gone, which is the problem. It's in beta, you know, but when it launches, we'll have a lot more deals. So there'll be a lot more to choose from. Yeah, right but now, still that, even if the deals are gone quick, that that's even better. Like that means I'm going to be on that bitch <laughs> freaking whenever the <laughs> clock ticks. Yeah, we've got uh, some lend or some borrowers in there that are really good. Like they don't need your money, and you're in a good position because someone gets dicked or any anything goes south, you're held harmless. And I've got a really good SEC attorney helping me on that back end. I've got I before I ever even talked about this in public, I built the team. You know, I, I don't know Randy Garns on my team. He, he's helped me build, it and he's built massive companies. So I got I got a rock star team that I'm I put together, and I spent a lot of money to do it because I wanted this thing to be done right, and it well, is. Well, well, I'm glad you dropped the bomb here on dropping bombs first. And, and I I truly did, and we saved it for this. This is the first time I publicly announced this, so I saved it for your show. How soon do you want people to start going to that site? Right now. Even today. Giddy up and go. Private money club. So if I drop this tomorrow, you could gauge who's going there now. 
Uh, just people from events that we do. Like we just did our three day. I told people about it there, but that's it. There's about 200 members in there right now. But again, it's just beta. I should have set up some sort of affiliate deal. Let's, well, you're you're going like, to get that. You're going to get, you're going to get like well, hundreds of thousands of people going, I'm in. Okay. So I don't see, I don't see how anybody ask, wouldn't be in. Cause again, if, if you're listening and you got some money, you ain't making 12% on your money and you don't have a platform to just go get it deployed quickly. That's correct. And if you need money, you don't have a plethora of lenders just sitting there waiting to freaking buy. But I do. Cause I created the dating site for it. I do have an affiliate program, so I'll give you, I will build you a link Yeah, and you can do that. And I we'll can put do an that link for in anyone. here. Yeah. We'll put that link. I know we will. Jenna, when you're listening to this, make sure you put that link in. Okay. Get it from Chris. Well, dude, I appreciate you coming out here. Are you guys hanging out for the weekend or not? Yeah, I've got, well, I've got three more podcasts and then I'm hopping on a red eye back home Wednesday. Gotta you're you're, you're doing girl. a podcast circuit, getting the word out. Mm -hmm. What else are you doing to get the word out? Just uh, events? PR. I got a PR agency. I got Steve Sims doing uh, marketing, my internal oh, marketing. Steve Sims. Team. Steve Sims. Like with the beard? You know Steve. Yeah. We, our, I told you, our circles are, are so close. Like once, you, if you start connecting the dots, you'll see. Old Steve Sims. Yeah. So he's, he loves this. So he's helped me promote it. Uh, uh, Daniel Scarpino is doing all the branding and the, the POV for me so that the brand design and the, you know, how we're going to launch this, he's doing that. He just did uh, some really, I can't name the names, otherwise I'll probably get in trouble, but we all know the big guy he does, he works with. So, well, dude, I appreciate you coming out folks. You heard it here first. Here comes a platform where you can get some money or make some money. Anything you'd like to say to the bomb squad? I just like to say it's been an honor and a privilege. Thanks, Brad. Thanks for having you. Or uh, thanks for coming. And folks, as always, keep it real. Dropping bombs with the real Bradley. Subscribe now. <laughs>